Uh, thank you uh, very much all um, for coming and for allowing me uh, to speak here. Um, I'm just going to echo really briefly some of the comments that previous speakers have made. Um, I think this is sort of a bittersweet moment. Um, I terribly miss Emmanuel as my senior colleague at Harvard and in our hallway. And one thing that I miss particularly that nobody mentioned yesterday is sort of his infectious laughter that like, I have that still ringing in my ear because I had a, a, an office uh, just a few doors down from Emmanuel's and you know, he'd leave his door open when he was talking to David, which was pretty, pretty much like starting at, you know, five, like the entire night. And that's what it felt like for me. And it was, it was a lot of laughter there uh, involved as well. All right. So I wanted to present this project, not because it's the most polished project that I have, but because I think it's the closest to what um, Emmanuel has recently worked on with, with David and some of his uh, uh, work with Ivan. And so that's why I wanted to present this. This is embarrassing, even after three years of you know, working on this, this is still work in progress. So any feedback that you have, uh, directions that we should look into uh, are more than welcome. So uh, this is project is called Disaggregated Economic Accounts. This is joint work with three amazing Danish co-authors, Oscar, Emil, and Niels, and Kilian, who is at the University of Chicago. And as the title already suggests, this is all about economic accounts, so I thought I would start with uh, an overview over, over national accounts. So in the 1930s, Simon Kuznets in the US and Richard Stone in the UK developed sort of a first comprehensive version of the national accounts that had all the aggregate flows in it, aggregate consumption, income, uh, production, etc. And one goal was to provide policymakers with much needed information on the state of the economy during the Great Depression and during World War II. And Richard Stone was actually working at the uh, British Treasury uh, with, with Keynes at the time to, 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 to uh, measure these accounts. And one key idea in the national accounts is that there is double entry bookkeeping, meaning that the income that shows up as received on the household account is also the income that shows up as paid on the uh, production account. And so once you have that being satisfied, you can draw sort of these you know, circular flow diagram that I'm sure you've seen in sort of undergrad textbooks, right? You know, households that earn income, maybe in terms of profits and labor, uh, and, and, and spend on, say, businesses, maybe spend abroad, okay? So these arrows here are all, you know, monetary flows, not, not the good flows that go in the opposite direction. Now, Richard Stone, actually, in the 1940s, um, included sort of the input-output tables as part of the national accounts. So he made everything consistent. In, before that, I didn't know this, the input-output tables were sort of a separate thing that Leontief had pioneered, and so he brought this into uh, the national accounts. And this is still the basis of modern-day national accounts. And in fact, Stone, who you might know from Stone Theory Preferences, he won, won the Nobel Prize not for his amazing preferences, but for this, uh, actually, uh, which is, which is uh, quite interesting. So what we attempt to do in this project is we want to develop a system of economic accounts that not just disaggregates the production side, but also the household side into consistently defined small units of households and producers that includes all the bilateral flows between all those units and at the end of the day is consistent with national accounting aggregates. Okay? So we call this the disaggregated economic accounts. And basically what we want to do, right, is we want to group individuals in an economy and establishments in an economy into many small cells. We're going to call those household cells and production cells. And, you know, the simplest possible grouping you could start with would be just to group them by, say, the sector of work or their sector of production. But in our application, we're going to go beyond that. We want to um, use sort of a region by sector um, grouping. And the ultimate goal, as I mentioned, is to measure these disaggregated economic accounts at the level of these individual cells, which includes all the bilateral flows between all pairs of these cells, meaning how much income I earn from a specific producer cell if I'm in a specific household cell, as well as flows between those cells and other broad sectors of the economy, such as the government, the rest of the world, or the finance sector. And as I said, comments are welcome. So in terms of these circular flow charts, we want to go from a description of the world like this to one like this, right? That has all these bilateral flows in it. We see exactly where you know, people spend, 
um, uh, how much they pay in taxes, how much you know, firms export, etc. So what I will talk about today, just to limit your expectations, is I'm going to start by explaining some of the measurement that we've been doing on those disaggregated economic accounts. And we're gonna do this measurement for Denmark. And now you see why I need three Danish co-authors on this project. Um, and we're gonna do this measurement in these uh, small region by sector cells. We're gonna have about 1,700 adults in one cell. So it's a pretty narrow uh, cell. And we're gonna measure flows using various kinds of administrative data sources that I didn't know existed and geocoded bank transactions data. And that's actually turns out to be key. And that took us like a year and a half just to, just to get the, the geocoded uh, transaction data to work well. So with that measurement, I'm gonna start to present a few new facts that we learned from, from this measurement, but there's more to come. This is just as it's sort of you know, coming hot off the press. Um, so what are some of these facts that we learned? So the first thing we can do with the geocoded uh, transaction data, we can actually estimate a gravity equation for consumer spending. And we see that, you know, how quickly it falls off with distance and the fit is relatively good, except that there's one notable deviation, which I, you know, it seemed intuitive, but I didn't really, didn't really cross my mind before, which is that spending on average uh, tends to flow upwards in density from the more rural parts of Denmark to the more urban parts of Denmark. Um, and that's gonna be important for some of the policy conclusions that, that will derive. Um, we also are able to track uh, foreign spending of all Danish adults. In fact, we document a lot of heterogeneity in foreign spending shares across both density and income. And it turns out that sort of the urban elite, the high income urban residents tend to spend more uh, abroad than, than everybody else. And then I'm gonna pack this into a model. And I'm gonna use the model just for two implications. For now, there's more that we're thinking about, but those are the two that uh, I have for you today. The first application is on the distributional gains from trade. And that's very much sort of a corollary of seeing that heterogeneity in foreign spending shares. And basically what we find there is that um, we see that the urban elite, the you know, high income urban residents benefit the most from a reduction in trade costs. So they benefit the most from globalization, uh, if you wish. And the second application is sort of a sort of a new Keynesian version of this model, where we study a targeted fiscal policy. And in this model, you can target fiscal policy precisely by the cell that you would like to stimulate. And you can see, you know, how does stimulus uh, differentially um, uh, propagate if you, you know, uh, uh, stimulate this cell versus that cell. And that turns out to matter because uh, depending on the shock that hits the economy, you might want to stimulate different kinds of cells. And in fact, one thing I'm gonna show you is that in Denmark, after a negative export demand shock, it's much harder to stimulate economic activity and you wanna stimulate different cells than uh, after a negative domestic demand shock. Yes? Just you have data on internet spending as well? Yes, we have data on internet spending as well. I'll, I'll talk about that. Yeah. Uh, another question in there, like you say, the spending from upwards in that city, uh, are you saying it's a trade imbalance? No. So within Denmark. Yeah. Within Denmark. Yeah, that, that's like a trade imbalance between these low density and high density. Or uh, how yes. How it, yes, exactly. And the reason okay, how this, exactly, how this fits together is that you're going to have that exports are mostly produced in rural parts. And so in some sense, you know, money enters the rural parts in Denmark because that's where many or most exports are produced. And then it starts propagating into the cities and then it, you know, flows out of the economy. That's how, that's the mental model in like, you know, 15 slides that I'll, that I'll get to. Great, there's a bunch of related literature, obviously very much related to David's work with Emmanuel, also related to some work Ivan has with Emmanuel. But I also wanna draw your attention just to French people that actually pioneered um, thinking about circular flows, thinking about measuring national accounts. Uh, Cantillon and Kenet that I didn't know before, uh, and I learned from some of David's work with Emmanuel about these, and it's kind of fascinating how they actually already, you know, emphasized different kinds of households. They had like artisans, farmers, entrepreneurs, and you know, they, their way of thinking about the world. Uh, and, and so we sort of left that aside because we could measure other things, you know, better, um, but hopefully we're kind of drawing attention back to their way of, of thinking about the world. Okay, great, so let me jump into the measurement. 
So as I said, the level of analysis are going to be region by sector cells. We're going to have 2,700 such cells in Denmark. Why 2,700 or approximately 2,700? Well, we're going to have 99 municipalities as our regions and 27 production sectors. Um, what are these sectors? So we're going to have 17 retail sectors, such as food away from home, groceries, fuel, airlines. Uh, we have 10 non-retail sectors, such as manufacturing, construction, etc. And we also allow for households for non-work sectors, because we want to basically assign every adult in Denmark to one cell. So we also allow for retired students, you know, long-term unemployed out of the workforce. So we're going to define these household cells as adults grouped by their region of residence and by their sector of work or you know, non-work. We're going to define production cells as establishments grouped by the region where they're located and their production sector. Now, the average household cell, as I mentioned, is fairly small, 1,700 uh, uh, residents. And the average production cell is also fairly small, has about 130 establishments. Yeah. I think for some applications, like the fiscal stimulus fund, you might be interested in tagging households, not based on just but things like level of assets. Yes. Great, great. We thought about that. Um, the main reason we didn't do this is because in many models, sort of assets are more endogenous than the characteristics we're using here, like sector of work or location. But definitely that's, you know, depending on the application, that may be or may not be uh, appropriate. Um, but yeah, um, this, is, this is the, I think, the more stable version, I guess, of the measurement. So the goal is then to try to disaggregate all flows in the national accounts down to the level of individual cells. So just to give you an example, um, there's a city in Denmark called Alberg. So one thing we want to, want to measure is, you know, how much do, say, grocery store workers in Alberg spend on you know, hotels in Copenhagen, right? That would be one such you know, uh, bilateral flow. So I'm not going to go over all of the flows in the national accounts today, because there's a reason these national accounting handbooks have 500 pages. And in fact, we're writing our own massive appendix to try to document exactly what we're doing on all those. I'm just going to give you a glimpse of how we're dealing with four important ones that sort of operate between you know, households and, and producers. Right? The most important that I'm going to talk about today is consumer spending. Here we're going to try to disaggregate household final consumption expenditure, uh, which is of the PCE you know, equivalent in Europe. Um, we're also going to, uh, I'm also going to quickly mention uh, how we disaggregate labor income, uh, profit income, and uh, intermediate input trade. Okay, and in the paper, we'll do everything else as well. Great, so what about disaggregating consumer spending? So the main data set that we use for this is the universe of customer to firm transactions from Danske Bank, which is the largest Danish retail bank. Basically, one in five Danish adults is a customer to this bank. Um, we're going to see essentially all transactions, all credit and debit card transactions, bill payments, direct debits, mobile payments, pretty much everything they use a bank account for. Now, the sample that we use are all adults that report this account at Danske Bank as their main account to the government and that at least make one transaction in 2018 and 19 using this account. And because we don't see all categories of you know, consumption in the national accounts in our data set, we actually augment this with several administrative data sets to get at some of the harder to get, harder to measure categories such as housing, finance, or, or vehicles. Great. So with this data set, the goal is to assign each customer's transactions to the receiving production cell, right? So we'd like to know for every transaction that, that as a, a customer makes, what is the address and what is the sector of the receiving um, establishment. Yeah. Do the banks use It's right there. The I'll talk about it. The Germans are you know, way out there. That's why we couldn't do this in Germany. But, and also, <laughs> Germans love privacy. And uh, for some reason, Scandinavians are like super happy to <laughs> give all information to the government. So we only have 9% of cash spending. <laughs> and um, totally ununderstandable to me, but, uh, but so we only have 9% of cash spending. We see, we see ATM withdrawals, but we don't obviously see where cash is being spent. And so, uh, and so we, for now, make the assumption that it's spent like everything else, but we could actually improve that if, you know, using surveys exactly sort of by sector, you know, which sectors are more likely to receive cash. Great, so we want to see where 
transactions are going. And that's not easy. And that took us a very long time to figure out. So for credit card and mobile payments, we actually see exactly where the terminal is, where the transaction was booked. And, uh, and so that uh, gives us the address. And we also see an MCC, a merchant classification code, which also took us a while to map into industrial codes, but uh, it, it works all out uh, at the end of the day. And for other transactions, like bill payments, for example, it turns out that even there, we can see through the raw data that the bank has that we don't even see as sort of customers, uh, we can also see an address. And so we're using that for those transactions. And there's only sort of a relatively small fraction left where we can't see the location, but we can see the sector. And for those, we use um, geocoded transactions by similar people, meaning members of the same household cell in similar sectors. Okay. And one thing I want to highlight, given the applications later on, is we also see transactions going abroad uh, by sector. So we see exactly how much you know, a, a Danish resident is spending, say, in Paris. Right? Now, two caveats. Um, cash already was mentioned. Online spending was mentioned as well. So one problem with online spending is sometimes it gets booked in locations that are not the locations where you actually go and you know, spend your uh, consumer good or service. Right? If I buy a movie ticket, chances are maybe the movie ticket company is located, say, in Bordeaux, but I go to the movie, movie uh, theater here in Paris. And so I would like to uh, reassign the location to where I actually go and, uh, and consume the, the good or service. And that's something we do on a case-by-case -case basis for, for these categories where, where there's this mismatch. Great. Now, I mentioned there's three categories that are hard to characterize with Danske Bank data, and there's these distinctions all over the place when you try to uh, actually build up to the national accounts. Let me just give you a, a sense of you know, how we can deal with these difficulties. So for example, housing is a really important part of consumption, um, especially imputed uh, uh, rents from owner-occupied housing. Now, at first, we thought that we're kind of out of luck there because we don't have, you know, that doesn't show up on, uh, on your bank account. But it turns out that in Denmark, you actually report not just the assessed property value of your owner-occupied house, but also an imputed rental equivalent. And that's exactly what the national accounts are actually using to construct aggregate uh, imputed rent. And, and we can do that at the individual level because we have all the tax returns, of course, right? Uh, so we can do that. Um, actual rental payments is relatively small in, in Denmark because lots of people just buy. Um, but the ones that are there, we see in our Danske Bank data and we scale it up to match the aggregate in the HFCE. Um, and, uh, and the only problem there is we don't have location information. So what do we do? We uh, you know, have to assign some sort of distance gradient for how you know, far away, say, landlords are located relative to where you live. And we use a distance gradient that I'm going to show you that comes out of the other kinds of uh, spending data. And there's you know, other categories, too, where we have to sort of use other administrative data sources to, to get ahead and really you know, complete the measurement. Those are not like the largest categories. like. You know, financial services, for example, is not huge, but we still want to, you know, match everything, and that's why we go through uh, a few other steps. <laughs> Sorry. So, so, so that's something we debated a lot. So the 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 question is, right? Do we try to measure households individually, but then households have different sizes, and so it gets messy. You know, if you cohabitate with someone, is that a household? Is that so it's, it, it gets messy pretty quick. So that's why we decided for now to sort of define it rigorously at the individual level. Okay, so then the question is, oh, but then are we missing intra-household transfers? And that's something that we're actually looking into right now because there are ways to measure those transfers and, and that's something that we're working on uh, actually these days. Great, so our procedure allows us to measure 83% of HFCE um, aggregates bottom up without mechanically matching the, uh, the HFC aggregates. And you see that some of these categories here for, for those uh, uh, it's satisfied and you see that you know, all, all, um, uh, on average the fit is actually quite good compared to the national accounts. And the remaining 17% like for example vehicles or financial services which I haven't talked much about um, there we actually need to you know, do it top down. We need to actually use the information from the, from the HFCE. Uh, aggregates. Now, why are there still some changes? Our Danish co-authors are actually convinced that some of these changes are mistakes in the national accounts because they have to survey, you know, retail establishments, you know, how, how many, you know, iPhones did you sell uh, uh, last month? 
Whereas we see exactly how much was being spent uh, by at least our customers. And they think actually that we measure some of this much better than the national accounts. I'm not gonna you know, take a <laughs> strong claim on this, but, but it's kind of reassuring that they're, they're pretty close. So what about other flows? So I mentioned labor income flows. Now that is very easy for us because we have administrative data on exactly where you live, where you work and how much you make. And so I can you know, construct that you know, matrix of flows for each you know, production cell across all household cells right away from, from the registered data. So that's easy. What's harder for us is to disaggregate input output linkages that we know at the sectoral level from the national accounts down to a sector by region level. And, and, and the one problem is we don't have VAT data. And so we use sort of an approach that, that is, I think, more commonly used in other countries like the US, um, where we uh, combine the sector input output matrix with regional production shares. We see how much is pro being produced in the different establishments and sort of a gravity relationship that comes from uh, essentially something like the commodity flow survey in, in, in Denmark. And finally, what our profit income? Um, we distinguish two types of profit income here, you know, corporate profits, which we can assign in line with administrative data on household stock market wealth. We see exactly how much you own in the stock market, so we can uh, uh, assign uh, the corporate prof profits according to that. And non-corporate profits, well, we see where the entrepreneurs are. We see where the business owners are, and so we can uh, 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 assign those non-corporate profits in line with, with that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So they don't have corporate, I guess there's some places there's these detailed firm level censuses for like, you know, firm orders, but you're not using anything like that. Firm orders? Oh, I just mean that I, I've heard of data sets being constructed that are much more detailed, the input output, uh, you know, uh, and so there's nothing like that in them. There's not like- So we have great firm level data, but I'm not sure it, it, it's exactly what, what you're thinking about. Just because you could disaggregate the input output, you know, more. Yeah, we don't, we don't have, you know, exactly. So we don't have firm to firm trade data. That's the only thing that Denmark doesn't have. It doesn't have VAT data that we can use. Uh, right, right. Respect the privacy of Exactly. Exactly. Want to respect the privacy of Lego, but not of uh, individuals in Denmark. Great. So let me see if this works here. So at the end of the day, if I just show you household cells and production cells, you want to go from a description of the world like this to one like this. Okay, this is the actual network that we, uh, you know, measure. Okay, all the nodes in this plot are either household cells or production cells. All the links are one of these four kinds of links that I explained. Now, the quality is unfortunately much poorer than I was hoping for, but you see the different colors. So those are different regions. And basically what we do is we throw this into a plotting algorithm and then just say, you know, find us sort of a, a, a nice looking network that sort of co-locates nodes that have a lot of you know, interactions with, with each other. And what's kind of fascinating, what I found fascinating, is that if you do this, you actually end up something that looks a lot like the geography of Denmark, right? If you know the geography of Denmark, then you know, this part over here, the left part is sort of the continental part, um, Jutland, and the part on the right is sort of the you know, major island where Copenhagen is located, uh, and that's Zealand. But it's not just the geography, in fact, it's, there's some deviations that are notable. So for example, in the middle, right, point right here, I don't know if you can see my cursor, that's the airport in Copenhagen. And why is it so far away from the rest of Copenhagen, which is over here, and that's where it geographically is also located? Well, because a lot of Danes spend on services and goods in the airport, right? And so that's why you know, our, our, uh, our network plotting algorithm wants it to be sort of more in the center. And there's other fun stories here. For example, this is an island that's over, way over on the right here, the Bornholm. But the reason it's pulled in closer is because you need an airline to fly there. And that airline is like based somewhere here. And so, you know, the, the network algorithm kind of wants it to be closer to where that airline is because a lot of Bornholm residents spend uh, on that airline. So there's a bunch of these things that are going on that could spend hours just uh, digesting that uh, network. Great. Now, I want to just document a few broad themes that come out of this measurement that are sort of in this network, but hard to see. And, and I'm gonna sort of group them into uh, four facts, okay? The fact one, very basic fact, most of these flows are sparse, okay? So for example, 90% of bilateral consumer spending flows 
make up only 0.5% of total spending or vice versa, you only need 10% of these flows to make up over 99% of all uh, the total consumer spending. And part of the reason why this is, is that there's a lot of geographic concentration. So just to give you an example, this is now an actual map of Denmark. And I've just picked this random location here, Newborg, which is close to the city here of Odense. And you know, I've just shown you, you know, spending shares across regions for personal service, uh, for service workers in, in Newburgh. And you see that on average, this is pretty concentrated around where they live. Now there's higher you know, spending in the city of Odense, which is close by, but there's also higher spending in other cities that are not so close. So for example, this is the second largest city in Denmark. This is, I think, the third largest city. This is Copenhagen. So you see that in a bunch of these you know, dense places, a lot of spending goes, even though it's not that, uh, 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 not that close. And that's something that we're going to pick up actually later uh, as well. But on average, if you run a gravity uh, regression, and so this, uh, these are sort of the residuals from that after taking out the two-way fixed effects. Basically, what you see is there's sort of a very you know, significant decline with distance, right? So in blue here, this is consumer spending. Now, you can do this for the other kinds of flows as well. And you see that labor income actually falls off with distance. You know, labor supply or commuting, this is what this ca is capturing, pretty much at the same speed as uh, consumer spending. Kind of natural, you know, input output trade falls off less with distance, right? It's easier to ship goods than uh, move people. And it's sort of the flat line over here, that's, um, that's profit flows. And obviously it's much easier to move money than, than goods, okay? So this falls off even less with distance. So that's fact one. Fact two is this fact that consumers spend in more urban places than they live. Okay, so I'm gonna illustrate this with the following bin scatter here. So we have on the x-axis log density of a consumer. Um, that's where the consumer lives. And on the y-axis, the average log density of where that consumer spending is going. Okay. And you see that it's a strongly increasing relationship, but it's sort of above the 45 degree line and somewhat tilted. And basically the interpretation is that if you live in a you know, less dense area, you tend to spend on denser areas. You tend to go into the cities or into the larger towns nearby uh, the, uh, to sort of consume goods and services. This is the only sort of violations are for the very, very you know, dense places, right? Like the municipalities around Copenhagen or, or Aarhus, for example. Um, those tend to spend in other cities more or less, okay? And this actually represents a deviation from gravity. You can write down a gravity uh, regression where you interact distance with sort of whether you're spending in a city or not and you're going to see that people are much more willing to sort of drive longer to go into cities and and, and spend there exactly exactly but even aside from that this effect is still there right on top of, the on top of that exactly exactly Ivan you had a question Yeah. Um, so you're not saying people in the city are not buying stuff from. No, they're exactly. Uh, but on average, they're buying much more in dense places. But that's more to be expected, I would think. Um, I'm worried it's about your, the data you're looking at because it's, let's suppose there was trade balance. I think you know the the guys doing the agricultural work. Yeah. They're not selling it directly, and no one's buying it directly from them. So you don't see them in their bank account. Right. But they're buying it from a firm, and you didn't have those firm transactions. You know, so I mean, you, you would want to think. I don't know if trade balance is a good approximation here, but so I don't think it's a good approximation. I'm going to show you some results on the external balance of these different parts of Denmark, and you're going to see that it's sort of very heterogeneous as well. Um, meaning, you know, there's a lot more exports here than here. And so that, I think, you know, implies that there doesn't have to be trade balance on sort of a, you know, region by region dimension, if that makes sense. Great. Um, the third fact is that one thing we find is that urban consumers tend to spend more abroad. Right? So on the left here, you see direct foreign spending shares by density again of the consumer. And you see that you know, there's a very strong uh, increase uh, in the direct foreign spending share, that you know, the share of your spending that directly is spent abroad on, say, airline tickets abroad or hotels or rental cars. 
and and you see um, you that you know in the denser uh, areas it's sort of more likely that consumers uh, go abroad and spend abroad. Um, interestingly, this is not shared if you look at the production side, and that's in line with what I'm going to tell you next, which is that the production side you see that it's the more rural parts, uh, 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 the more rural production cells that have a higher import share rather than the more urban cells. And why is that? Because in the more rural parts, that's where you know mo most of the export industries are located. Okay, so those low density uh, regions are the ones that you know export more to uh, the rest of the world, and they. This is just a simple bar plot over there that's just showing you that they export different kinds of goods from the ones that you know Danish uh, households typically uh, consume. So is it exposed to the rest of the world as opposed to exporting to other regions? Yes, ex exactly, export to the rest of the world. We can also see how much they export to other regions, but um, in, in, you know, if, if we didn't have that, then Ivan would be totally right that you know the agriculture workers in you know the rural parts. Um, or the you know manufacturing uh, uh, um, you know establishments in the rural parts they would have to export into the cities right. Um, so now I understand. I, I thought you meant exports between the regions. No 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 exports to the rest of the world exactly exactly thanks for clarifying. So I was, was confusing between the first statement where you said that the rural part was the more exporting, and then which on the previous figure was said that most of the spending. Yeah this is this is just to clarify this is consumer spending. This is consumer spending. This is not all, all spending, exactly. So, to be good to have a sense debate, if the rural workers in rural parts would produce potatoes and tomatoes, and then the, the, the farm itself is selling them to the supermarket in the city, that picture would also work, right? Correct. So, I don't need to, I mean, the, the, That's why the, firm, the firm flows are not in the picture. Correct. So, I, Correct. I, I firm the picture just from supermarket sales always in the city center. Correct. Okay. Correct. That's why you need this other picture. So if I had to summarize it in a very simple stylized plot, what we've kind of learned here is that you know the, the uh, production cells that are exporting are the ones in the rural regions. That's where sort of money you know enters the Danish economy. Um, they then you know import some amount of goods, so that is money flowing out again. They also pay their workers that live in the more rural regions of Denmark. These workers they have consumer spending, right? Some amount of their spending is local. Uh, but some of it also goes into the cities. Now, in the cities, there's predominantly, you know, service and non-tradable uh, uh, um, production, and, and and those producers pay their workers that live in the predominantly urban regions, and those then have a relatively high share of spending abroad. So this is sort of the stylized, you know, circular flow that sort of comes out. Obviously, the underlying, you know, detailed circular flow is much more complicated than this. But just to give you, you know. A, a stylized uh, perspective on, on what I've told you. Okay, great. So in my remaining uh, 10 minutes or so, I'm going to uh, talk about what we can learn uh, from this measurement exercise. Now, I'm not going to have time to run through all the equations of the model, but I want to give you the gist of what the model is doing. Okay, so what is this? This is going to be a static spatial equilibrium model that has basically a representation of some of the disaggregated economic accounts that we measure. So it has many household cells, many production cells, has the rest of the world, has a government. Okay, This is close to the HAIO model that David and Emmanuel have uh, recently uh, developed. And some of the key links in the model are informed by our measurement. So just to give you two examples, households have heterogeneous nested CES preferences across goods. Where are the weights coming from? Well, they're coming from exactly the spending shares that we can compute in our measurement, right? So we're going to get a matrix of spending shares where sort of all the columns uh, correspond to different household cells and the entries in the column correspond to the shares across all the production cells that you're spending on. Um, and the other example, sort of intermediate input trade, right? This is captured by a standard uh, input output matrix where sort of the columns correspond to where uh, specific production cells are sourcing from. I'm going to make my life very easy today. I'm going to just show you a Cobb Douglas you know, equation from a Cobb Douglas model, but you can generalize this, uh, and that's what we're going to have in the paper. Now, in this Cobb Douglas model, the direct and indirect expenditure shares on foreign goods are sufficient statistics for the gains from trade. And uh, what does that mean? That means if I reduce trade costs in this model, the welfare effect across all household cells is given by this expression. And at the end of the day, what this is summing is a direct effect that captures all the spending that is not domestic. That's why it looks this funny way. That's all the direct foreign spending 
of uh, Danish um, adults. And on the right, we have the indirect effect via the input-output uh, matrix, right? That, uh, you know, that maybe you buy you know, a sandwich and that had ham on it that was sort of imported from the UK, right? And what's kind of special is that, and I did not know this, but not many papers measure a direct effect um, in, in, in the literature on the gains from trade. And not many papers measure both effects. So I'm going to show you what we learn about the gains from trade across different uh, splits of, of our household cell distribution um, for both of these effects. Okay. So on the left here, you see the gains from trade across density. On the right, across income. And what I would like you to see here is that if you only have the indirect effect, and that's what you use to infer how much people are exposed to trade costs, you would not, ex you know, you not infer a very strong relationship across density and across income. You would say maybe you know, gains from trade, globalization, maybe they're not so biased towards one or the other kind of, of group. But once you add the direct spending, direct foreign spending by uh, Danish uh, residents, you see that actually there's a very strong relationship at the end of the day in both of these dimensions. And so the people that tend to be you're benefiting the most from a reduction trade costs are sort of the urban consumers and the you know, high income uh, consumers in Denmark. Great. The second application. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Please. Subsequent work, could you imagine disaggregating even further by other occupations or, uh, or income brackets? Is yeah. that something that you. That's great. Poor, the rich, the, the blue colors? Perfect. Is that something that you can extend this method? That, that's, yeah, we can definitely extend it. We have not done this yet. Um, we have a fair amount of income variation, but certainly not as much as we would get if we literally split by income. Um, it's fairly involved to do this measurement, so I, we're going to run with this for, for this project, but we can definitely, exactly, we can definitely do a lot. 100%, 100%. So in my last few minutes, I just want to do sketch a different application. It's, it seems extremely different, but you can still inform it, I think, with what we're measuring. I'm not going to give you, again, all the details, but you can take this model, that sort of nested CS model with all the ingredients, and you can turn it into a dynamic one where you can add nominal rigidities. And we're going to do this in a way, and that's something that uh, Ivan and I have done in a recent uh, project, and, and David and Emmanuel have also done in a recent project. You can do this in a way where still all the propagations happen happens at date zero. Okay? And so at date zero, what we're going to introduce is this downward nominal wage rigidity which can, for a given production cell, either be binding or not binding, right? If the downward nominal wage rigidity is binding, then there's slack, so to speak, in the production cell. There's sort of unemployment among the workers that work in that production cell, okay? We're going to denote this by an indicator phi that is equal to 1. Vice versa, if that rigidity is not binding, then the sector produces at capacity, and then we're going to denote this by a phi that's equal to 0. And from this description, you can already see that there's going to be, once you add a shock into this you know, Keynesian model, there's going to be some cells that are going to produce below capacity, and we would like to stimulate those. Right? But if you end up stimulating demand for cells that already produce at capacity, all that you're going to do is you're going to raise prices and wages, and you're going to uh, start to create inflation. So this idea of targeting you know, stimulus to specific you know, household or specific production cells it becomes a very, very sort of relevant question that we can answer in the context of, uh, of this model. Okay? Yes, we actually do that, but I, I did not have any time to talk about that. But that's something we absolutely uh, look at as well. Yeah. Um, so um, one thing we do for this, just to mention it, we need MPCs for, 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 for this to make any sense. And we actually do estimate household cell level MPCs um, based on a different paper that was, was written uh, about estimating Danish NPCs, we just piggyback on what, what they've done. I'm not going to give you the details, but you end up with a you know, fairly reasonable NPC distribution. So now let's imagine we have a shock that hit the Danish economy that gives you sort of a specific pattern of, of these fees, right? Some production cells are maybe operating at capacity, others maybe have slack, right? So then the question is, across all household cells, if I send checks to the specific household cells, how large is the real multiplier, right? And if, they, you know, if I send a check to somebody, to say, you know, Rohan, and he spends on, you know, uh, 
on Mars as goods, but Mars is already producing a capacity that would not increase real output. That would be a real multiplier of zero. Okay, so how large are these real multipliers? And here's the result. Um, you can you compute them closed form in this economy. There's a bunch of matrices here that are multiplied, but the gist of um, of what's going on is uh, that the multiplier is large for a lot of sort of obvious reasons that you would expect. For example, if the MPC is high, or if you get a, a transfer to people that spend more in Denmark than in the rest of the world, right? Um, um, or you know, if the labor share of the goods that they're buying is very high. But the thing I want to focus on is this fee term, right? And this fee term tells you that at the end of the day, if the spending that you cause by sending a check to a specific household cell does not benefit cells, uh, production cells that have slack, then it's not going to increase real output and it's just going to create uh, inflation. Okay, I'm going to give you a very simple, uh, um, very simple illustration of how this works for two kinds of shocks. And for these shocks, um, I, you know, I take two, you know, origins of these shocks, right? One is a negative export demand shock that tends to lead to unemployment and sort of these rural, you know, export production cells. And the other is a domestic demand shock. And because you know that consumers, perfect, um, consumers like to spend in denser regions, those is gonna, that's, that, uh, that domestic demand shock is going to ca uh, cause uh, unemployment and sort of these urban retail or services uh, cells. So this is the distribution of uh, transfer multipliers that you get for both of these kinds of shocks. On the left, this export demand shock. On the right, the domestic demand shock. And the distribution is across all household cells. So this is, you know, you see already just by glancing at it that there's a lot of heterogeneity in how large this multiplier is depending on who you're giving uh, a dollar to. But one thing that's also quite striking is that overall, these the levels of the uh, multipliers on the left in response to a negative export demand shocks are much smaller than the ones on the right for a negative domestic demand shock. And the reason is pretty intuitive because if consumers in Denmark tend to like to spend in cities on sort of services and you know, uh, local non-tradables, then they're not going to actually you know, stimulate, say, ship production, right? Something that you know, Denmark uh, 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 exports a lot of. Vice versa, if you have a negative domestic demand shock, then you know, fiscal stimulus is actually much more effective because then the money can actually go exactly in the places that suffered from the negative uh, demand shock. All right, with that, I'm going to conclude. So what we try to do in this ongoing work is we try to measure the disaggregated economic accounts for Denmark. Um, I think this informs shock propagation, such as trade shock or more generally sort of the gains from trade but also, you know, short run demand shocks. And, and hopefully we can, you know, use this framework to ultimately help us design better targeted policies that we don't run into, you know, these inflation problems, for example, that, that we're facing uh, right now. Thank you uh, very much.